So the last piece of this thermodynamic puzzle we're going to look at is the relationship pretty much between delta G and our equilibrium constant. Now, a, the thermodynamic equilibrium constant K is one in which the concentration of gases are expressed in partial pressures, which are in atmospheres, and concentration of solutes that are in liquid solutions are expressed in molarity. Now if we have an expression that only has gases in it, well then our th thermodynamic equilibrium constant is equal to Kp or Kc, like we saw earlier when we studied equilibrium. If we have an expression with only aqueous solutes, then that would just be K is equal to Kc. And if we have an equilibrium that is showing dissolving, then that would be um, the thermodynamic equilibrium constant K would be the same as Ksp. So where it gets a little different, like here we have that reaction where ammonia gas reacts with carbon dioxide gas to make urea and water. So the thermodynamic equilibrium constant expression here is the concentration of urea divided by the partial pressure of ammonia squared times the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Water is a liquid it still is not in the equilibrium expression and neither would any solids be. Okay, so how can we relate our thermodynamic equilibrium constant and G? Well first off, if you want to find delta G at non-standard conditions, meaning our non-standard 1 atmosphere 25 degrees Celsius, when we always see our degree symbol, if you want to find that then you simply take the delta G at standard conditions and adjust it by multiplying by RT ln Q. Of course, Q takes on the same expression as K. And that's okay, but really, we like to focus at equilibrium. And so, when we're looking at equilibrium, delta G is equal to zero. There's no free energy change at equilibrium. And Q, of course, is equal to our equilibrium constant. So we can rearrange that equation, since delta G is equal to zero, and we get that our standard delta G is equal to negative RT ln K. And this expression, this equation, is found on your AP chemistry test packet. So that's something they want us to be able to know how to use. So yay, we're all happy because now we can calculate our equilibrium constants from delta G of formation values. All right, so let's take a look at that. First off, here's that reaction again, ammonia and carbon dioxide. So what is the equilibrium constant at 25 degrees Celsius? Well, earlier we have calculated delta G for this reaction, and it's negative 13.6 kilojoules. What does that mean again? It means this reaction is thermodynamically favored at this temperature and as it is written. And that value means that the, at equilibrium we should expect to have products being favored. And so hopefully when we calculate K here we should see a value that shows us that products are favored at equilibrium. R, again, is in our AP packet, 8.314 joules per mole, mole Kelvin. So we have to be careful here, kilojoules, joules. So when we plug into our equation, the natural log of K is equal to negative 13,600 joules divided by negative RT. Now, I get 5.49. Is that my equilibrium constant? No, that's the natural log of. So we have to use our good buddy E, the reverse of the natural log, and we get a, a value of 242, which does signify to us that products are favored. K is greater than 1. Not hugely favored like a combustion reaction, but favored nonetheless. Here's another example. We have calculating K from delta G, and we see the dissolving of silver chloride. So this K is going to end up being a Ksp value. Well, there's my delta G information from the tables like I gave you. Products minus reactants, and we get 55.6 kilojoules. What are we expecting? Well, this value of delta G says, hey, this reaction 
is not thermodynamically favored as written. And at equilibrium, we're going to have a lot of products, which makes sense, because when we calculate KSPs and look at KSPs, we're talking about not very soluble salts, so we expect an equilibrium composition with a lot of reactants and a small K value. So when we plug in using 55,600 joules divided by negative RT, and then use the reverse natural log of that, we end up with 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10th, which is the KSP value for silver chloride at 25 degrees Celsius. And that did relate to our delta G. There's one a little relationship you can notice. When K is greater than 1, natural log of K is positive. So in order for that to be true, delta G has to be negative because negative divided by negative would get, give us the positive. When k is less than 1, natural log of k ends up being negative. So delta G in that instance has to be positive since the bottom of our expression is negative RT. That's OK, and that, help, that helps us. But this um, chart is going to be much more influential. So if you want to find delta G or K at a temperature other than 25 degrees Celsius, the real calculation is rather complex and beyond the scope of this course. But we can do a pretty simple method with an equation we're already familiar with, and that gives us a pretty good approximation. The assumption we have to make is that delta S and delta H are essentially constant with temperature. We know that's not perfectly true. You know, entropy increases as temperature does. but it's nowhere near as dramatic as the effect of temperature on K and delta G, because they are very temperature dependent. So this table can be found anywhere on the internet, or you can find it in your book on page 756. But when we take a little closer look at it, magic pen. <laughs> when delta H has a negative value, meaning exothermic. Sorry, that's not going to work. So when it's negative for delta H and a positive delta S, well, when you look at our equation, if you plug in a positive value for delta, or I'm sorry, a negative value for delta H, negative minus a positive is going to give us a bigger negative number. So in that instance, Delta G is always negative, and that reaction is always spontaneous at every temperature, always thermodynamically favored. So again, delta H is negative, delta S is positive. That reaction is always going to be thermodynamically favored at any temperature. And then oppositely, if we have an endothermic reaction, a positive delta H with a negative delta S, then delta G is always going to end up being positive. So as written, that reaction is never thermodynamically favored at all temperatures. The reverse is, but not as written. And then you have your other two situations, negative negative and positive positive. And for these situations, there's going to be a temperature where the spontaneity flips. So if we have a negative delta H and a negative delta S, at low temperatures, we're going to have a thermodynamically favored reaction. And then at some temperature, it's going to flip and become non-favored at a higher temperature. Positive, positive, it's going to be non-favored at low temperatures. And then at some temperature, it's going to flip and become favored. You just got to know this chart. Okay, It's one of those things, as soon as we get our AP test, You'll flip to your thermodynamics section, and you'll go negative, positive, positive, negative, 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 positive, positive, and you'll quickly sketch out what that means, and you'll be good to go. Just be careful, because high temperature is relative. All right? Room temperature can be high temperatures. All right? So you see down here this last reaction, water solid turning to liquid water, the melting of water. We know that happens at zero degrees Celsius. Okay, but it, it falls into that one of those categories where delta H is positive, as is delta S. So at low temperatures, that doesn't happen. But it does happen at high temperatures, quote unquote, zero degrees Celsius. 
with all the gaseous reactions and everything, room temperature and zero degrees Celsius can be quote unquote a high temperature that we're working with. All right, so looking at the calculations, here we have the decomposition of calcium carbonate. Well, at 25 degrees Celsius, delta H is 178.3 kilojoules. Positive value, endothermic reaction. Delta S is 159 joules per Kelvin, increasing in entropy. We see a solid producing a gas. Delta G is 130.9 kilojoules, not thermodynamically favored as written. And when we get to equilibrium, we are expecting mostly reactants. And we see that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 1.1 times 10 to the negative 23 atmospheres, pretty much zero. So you can see at room temperature, calcium carbonate is very stable. That's chalk. So when you walk into a classroom, you don't just see chalk randomly decomposing in front of your eyes. Now, is this reaction thermodynamically favored at 1,000 degrees Celsius? Well, here we can calculate our delta G at this temperature. We take our delta H minus T delta S. And so when we plug in our numbers and making sure that the delta H is in kilojoules as well as the delta S, we end up seeing that now this reaction is thermodynamically favored. And so we can calculate K. So we have our negative 24,100 joules. And then we see our temperature, 1273 Kelvin. Take the E of that, and we get 9.78 is our K. How do I know it's KP? Well, solid, solid. The only thing in my equilibrium expression is the pressure of carbon dioxide. So at this juncture, we see that KP is equal to that pressure. So the pressure of my carbon dioxide is 9.78 atmospheres, 10 times greater than normal atmospheric pressure, where at 25 degrees Celsius, it was simply basically 0, 1 times 10 to the negative 23rd. So what temperature did this reaction magically flip? Okay, At 25, it was non-favored. At 1,000, it was favored. So what temperature did it switch? I can find that out because at that point, my delta G is equal to 0. All right, and so I can rearrange my equation and I can eventually set it up so that to find the temperature at which a reaction will flip from being favored to not being favored or vice versa, you simply take delta H divided by delta S. So we look at those values that were given to us earlier. Again, make sure it's either kilojoules over kilojoules or joules over joules. Either way, we'll find that temperature to be 1,121 Kelvin, or 848 degrees Celsius. So what that tells me, as a chemist, as a scientist, solid calcium carbonate is stable against thermal decomposition at one atmosphere of pressure until 848 degrees Celsius. So if I raise the temperature of the classroom to 849 degrees Celsius, when you come in here, you would see that the calcium carbonate would start to be decomposing in front of your very eyes, if your eyes hadn't melted out. Okay? And again, <laughs> what's chalk? Like, when's the last time, if ever, I've used chalk in this classroom? We created it in that one lab, and people drew, drew on the chalkboard, but... Anyway, this wraps up our thermodynamic unit, and I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you soon.